So we're from Expedia Group. Um, we're gonna go over some of the, the problems we had um, in our Istio adoption. Uh, we're gonna start from the page out all the way to the diagnostic steps and uh, how we got to a solution. So uh, let's do some introductions because the way we diagnose this between different engineers is, is how we got to the solution. So <clears throat> I'm Tim, uh, I started at Orbit in 2009, so I've been in the travel industry for forever. Uh, now Orbit's is uh, Expedia. Um, I like to call myself ops dev. I know the DevOps buzzword floated around, but I've always taken issue with that. I do ops things first and then dev. Hi everyone, myself Raghav Grover, and I work with Tim at Expedia as a senior software engineer. And uh, unlike Tim, I'm a dev first guy, and I think that's how we complement each other. And I've made some contributions to projects like Crossplane, Carpenter, and STO. All right, just a brief overview again. Uh, we're gonna go over what the actual issue was with this deal when we adopted this and, and scaled up. Uh, we'll go over possible bottlenecks. We're gonna dive a little bit into how it works if you're not familiar, so we'll cover that. And then we'll dive into some of the good stuff, remote debugging, uh, the actual solution, and uh, some stuff we added to help you out if you might go down this road. Uh, so here's the actual issue. Uh, you know, this is, this is where the page out starts. We've been paged. 500 errors, uh-oh, it's probably our fault, we're not sure, uh, and it's lasting a really long time. A, a pod terminates, and for nine minutes, users are seeing a 500 error. So this is a worst case scenario for us. Um, at some point, we determined the cause. Uh, pod churn was causing this to happen. So every time a pod was deleted, uh, we would see these, these 500 error codes, right? Um, and our pod sets are really big, so that's important to the story. This cluster had grown dramatically because we're moving to it. Uh, we have 1,200 pod set, a 600, a 900, a 300, so they're all like really big and they release very frequently. Uh, so Istio architecture. This is where we need to step into a little bit of uh, how this was all working. So. Here's the ingress. All your traffic is coming in from the internet to the ingress. It then flows to your pods, right? In our scenario, uh, pod gets deleted, and then the 500 errors begin. So if you're familiar with Istio, uh, what should be happening here is Istio should be getting updates from API server. Those should go down to everything and tell everything where everything is. That didn't seem to be happening, and the first proof we had of that is somebody restarted Istio D. Oh my gosh, that nine minute window was gone. Everything gets fixed immediately on restart of SCOD. So we started looking at suspects, and myself being an operations guy, we didn't give API server enough horsepower. So it must be API server. Unfortunately, we can't adjust it, it's a hosted one. So we had to prove it another way. Oh, I got a little bit ahead of myself. This is about the size we're at. Um, there's some hypothetical numbers out there of you can have 150,000 pods in Kubernetes, uh, whatever. This is, seems to be the number where we hit a brick wall. Uh, we, we tried everything as well at this point. We gave Istio D as much horsepower as we could. We took off limiters. We gave it a crazy amount of CPU, and it took it all, 2,500 cores at, at full usage, and we were still seeing this problem. So what could have been the bottlenecks Again, it, it's either Istio D at this point, because the fact we know for sure is restarting Istio D fixes it right away, or API server, which is tricky to prove. So finally, Ops Dev Tim is gonna do some, some dev. If you're a Golang perfectionist, I'm sorry, this is very hastily written up. It was a page out. I know I'm not catching the air, and there's a squiggly line there, but essentially what we, we did was say, okay, how do we prove it's API server or not? We create a pod every 20 seconds, and then we put an informer in our, in our software. And then it catches it and finds out how long it took to show up. Well, it definitely wasn't this. It took in the milliseconds. So at this point, we're all doubting it's API server. And somebody pointed out there's a lot of informers in Istio. Um, 
So we decided, okay, let's look at the endpoint controller. We didn't write code for this one. We just did some log queries, and, and again, it was in the milliseconds. So it's starting to look like it's some problem inside of Istio. Uh, this is a fun part. If you're really familiar with Istio D, you're probably already thinking this. Did you namespace isolate? Because those configs can get really, really big. No, <laughs> we did not. So we started doing that. We took all those big pod sets, the ones that were 50, you know, 1,200 and they release 50 times a day, all the rapid churn ones. We did isolation on them. So the config, I believe, was about 50 megabytes uh, and it shrank down to, I think, five or six. And the problem still wasn't solved. So at this point, we've tried a lot of operational tricks to try and tune this thing and it, it's still not working. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Raghav because I think that's when he jumped in on this. Yeah, so this is one of my favorite memes and it precisely depicts the situation that we were in. We have thrown more CPU at STOD, it doesn't work. We have downscaled our cluster uh, horizontally and upscaled it vertically in order to increase the number of pods per node so that the number of daemon set pods come down and address any scalability issues related to pods, but that didn't work. As Timothy mentioned, we, uh, we uh, implemented namespace isolation to optimize the Istio proxy config distribution and also reduce its size, but that also didn't work. And we checked for the lag in informer and the endpoint controller that also didn't point us to anything significant. And that's where we turned our eyes to STOD and we started looking into in the internals of STOD because STOD is the control plane of STO, it's the brain of STO. So the chances that it is introducing delay somewhere along the path are, are far significant higher than any other component uh, in the cluster. So let's have a look at the internals of STOD and try to understand, uh, uh, try to understand and let's see how that uh, works for us. So uh, the blue dashed box you see represents STOD, uh, precisely pilot inside of STOD. And on the left hand side, you see Kubernetes API server, which is feeding events into, into this queue called controller queue. And these events actually represent the state of the cluster. And if you were around a talk by John Howard, who is one of the maintainers of uh, Istio, they said that Istio actually subscribes to 45 or, or, or around that a different type of objects uh, in Kubernetes and gets all those objects into this queue. But this particular queue is uh, by design non-concurrent, which, uh, which means that any element that is being dequeued is being processed one at a time uh, from this queue. And the next stage we have debounce where the events are made to wait and merge because Generating Istio proxy config is a CPU intensive task and distributing it over the XTS API requires a lot of bandwidth. So events are uh, like required to wait and merge here for a specified number of uh, uh, time and in order to optimize things a little bit. After some context gathering uh, and initializations, uh, the events are converted into what is known as push requests, and they are placed into this push queue, where on the bottom right hand side, you can see that by default, there are 100 go routines that are feeding on this push queue to generate and send the Istio proxy config for each and every sidecar proxy that is connected to this particular instance of Istio D. And the number of go routines there can actually be controlled by a flag called pilot push throttle and later we'll see how, how changing that flag from a default value of 100 actually worked for us. And then came the remote debugging. We came across this uh, awesome documentation from Istio which, which described on how we can uh, create a custom Istio, image, Istio D image with Delve enabled into it. So that document was really an eye opening for us because it gave us the ability to actually debug the Istio D pod, which is running remotely inside a remote EKS cluster, and we can look at the internals of the code and debug it from our uh, local ID, because we were able to replicate 
the issue by creating more churn uh, in one of our sandbox clusters. So because now we have the ability to debug STO code, let's see what it pointed us to. So this is a screenshot of our, one of our debugger when, when there was some port churn in, and the port churn was at peak. And a uh, few slides back, we talked about this controller queue, which was getting all those events from, from the API server. At, at that peak, it had 20,000 elements into it, and they were taking a lot of time to get processed, which clearly was signifying that there was some contention, there is uh, some delay along this path. And, uh, but, but from an observability point of view, that controller queue uh, had only error loggings. It had no metrics that could point us to the number of elements in that queue or the type of object distribution in that queue. We now know that there is something getting piled up in that queue, but we don't know the, the type of objects. Uh, are there any specific objects that are taking more time than others? That could give us some uh, evidence as to what's happening. But uh, now we'll dive into some code. But before that, uh, because there were no graphs, there were no metrics out of this controller queue. So we assumed everything was right. But it turned out it was not the case for, for this particular piece of code. And what does controller queue exactly contain? So it contains the. Uh, callbacks that are generated from the informer events. So if a pod terminates, then there is a specific piece of code in STOD that will handle that pod termination. And there are different types of callbacks which, uh, which are subscribed for, for different types of objects. And uh, these callbacks are the ones that are actually placed into this queue, uh, this controller queue. And when you process this queue, you dequeue uh, an element from from this queue, and you call that or call back, or you call that function to uh, uh, process this queue in a in a non concurrent way. But as I said, up till now we had no clue whether this uh, delay was being introduced by pod events, endpoint events, service events, or other forty different types of objects that Studi uh, listens to. So we decided to modify some code uh, inside uh, Istio D. And uh, rather than just pushing the callback into this controller queue, now we were sending some more data. And we were attaching some metadata <coughs> sorry, uh, related to the type, uh, related to the timestamp when this particular event was pushed into the queue, and also the type of the object that this particular change event is related to. And this is almost the change that we make. So on the type, on the top, you can see that c.q is the controller queue that we have been talking about. It has a push function, which gets a, f uh, which gets a function which has no arguments, but return an error. So what we converted was to, uh, because this, uh, this controller queue was being used uh, at 50 different uh, uh, places in, in the STOD source code. So we converted that interface and modified it to push an enriched version of the callback, not just the callback, but we are now pushing uh, the, attaching the start time and also the type of the object that this particular change event is related to. And while processing this queue, we actually uh, placed in additional logs so that it could lead us to further evidence and uh, we generated some custom metrics uh, related to those logs uh, to, to infer the time it is taking for any object to, uh, to get dequeued and especially to get pro processed. So after all those uh, fun things, we actually uh, came out to a very interesting point that endpoint slices were the main culprit, and they were taking the max time to get processed out of all those 40 different objects. And uh, on a peak during the port churn, it would take 800 milliseconds just to process one, one uh, of the endpoint slice uh, event. Uh, and if we assume that during the port churn, we have 1,000 port terminations, and there, that leads to uh, 500 endpoint slice update events, uh, it, it translates to a delay of almost six minutes, which means that 
the, the uh, cluster is actually operating on a stale configuration that is present inside the cluster for six minutes, and that's why the ingress is still routing uh, traffic to a pod that is uh, long gone before, uh, before it gets that updated information. But with all those additional logs and metrics pointed us to the fact that endpoint slices are the culprit for, for this kind of situation. When we generated the, the CPU profiles of HDOD, we noticed a similar thing. We noticed that these two paths are uh, being dependent and they are trying to contend for a lock. Uh, but, and the interesting part is that these, both of these uh, paths are actually related uh, to endpoint processing. The gray one is related to the controller queue, as uh, we mentioned, and the red one is the one which is, the, which is related to pushing the XDS uh, config out uh, using the uh, XDS API. And uh, they are both trying to fight for the same log. Uh, and uh, when we shared all those uh, metrics uh, logs and the HDOD, uh, CPU profiles, uh, the maintainers were very swift to acknowledge the issue and they were very swift to uh, fix the issue from the root cause and they moved some, uh, removed some heavyweight processing that was happening inside of the logs to outside so that it can optimize some, uh, some things. But all this was happening uh, in version 1.17.1 way back in uh, June or, or May, I think. And, uh, but the actual fix came out in September uh, with fix, like in version 1.19.0. But uh, till that, till that uh, official fix was available, Expedia's reliability engineering team actually found a very interesting workaround to this problem, which solved majority of the log contention and majority of our problem was uh, gone. So let's see uh, that, what that change was. So few slides back, we talked about a flag called pilot push throttle, which controlled the number of go routines. And it, it turns out that uh, when we change that number to uh, match the number of vCPUs from a default value of 100, we, when we change effectively to a, a value of 16, we saw a huge drop in the processing time of endpoint slice uh, update events. and. Uh, from, from 450 milliseconds that actually came down to uh, less than 50 milliseconds and majority of the log contention for us was gone and uh, uh, we were happy. But why did that fix actually work was the fact uh, we've already uh, showed you this CPU profile, but uh, the interesting thing is that the, there is an imbalance in the number of go routines that are trying to get the, get the same log. So uh, the gray path is the one which, is, uh, which, is, which belongs to the controller queue, and uh, as, we, as we mentioned that it, it, uh, it is operating on a one single go routine, it is non-concurrent, but the uh, red path is actually having those 100 go routines that are trying to get the log, and when we, uh, when we change that number from 100 to 16, the number of routines that were fighting for the lock actually came down and uh, the contention was uh, gone. So we took this opportunity to introduce and add metrics to the controller queue and uh, we added metrics related to the latency, uh, which represents the time it took to dequeue uh, the element and the number of, uh, we also added metrics related to the controller, uh, sorry, the depth queue, which represents the number of elements in the queue, and also the processing time, which means uh, the time it took to process the dequeued event. So uh, these metrics are all available uh, in version 1.19.0, along with the fix uh, with the, from the author. And they can be enabled by setting the environment flag is to enable controller queue metrics. And on the screen, we have the uh, QR code if anybody is interested uh, for the link uh, for the PR that we opened to Istio. So I'd like to give a huge shout out to uh, 
to Istio maintainers, especially John Howard, you must have heard his talks. And uh, he was very uh, swift to acknowledge the issue once we shared uh, all the evidences that we have gathered. Uh, and they, were, they addressed the uh, uh, issue in, in no time. And uh, so kudos to, to them and the community. I think Expedia owes them a few drinks and some pizzas. Uh, regarding the takeaways, let's talk about takeaways, uh, because as users of open source prod products like Istio, we should make our best efforts to contribute back to them, and not just through code, because often contributing through code is considered as challenging, but there are other ways, like uh, developing the internals, uh, understanding of the internals of the project, or improving the documentation, or as little as uh, even fixing comments and uh, the typos uh, go a long way. But I've often seen individuals and even companies treat open source tools like a black box where they don't understand the internals of it, but when they are in some kind of a problem, they, the, the help from the community is actually demanded and uh, that, that perspective needs to be changed because for the big big projects, it's easy for them to offer enterprise support, but for for the smaller projects, it's uh, it's difficult uh, for them when when that uh, kind of support is uh, demanded without uh, knowing the internals of the project. And well, thank you all for listening. Uh, we have a medium blog that describes this same journey in a little bit uh, detail. On the right, we have the Istio GitHub issue that we opened uh, with the community to get some uh, help from them. And you can leave us the feedback if you like this session or not uh, on, on their rightmost QR code. And yeah, thank you all for listening. And I hope it was fun and not too intense in terms of, in terms of the technical depth and uh, aspect, so thank you all. Any questions? All right, thank you. I think we have one. Oh. Um, I was curious, uh, in the slides you mentioned the workaround that you guys used to get around it before the uh, Istio maintainers were able to fix it, but do you know what the Istio maintainers did to fix it in the 1.19 version that w was fixed? And um, could, if you do, could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so they turned, uh, uh, there was some ha heavyweight processing that was happening inside the lock, but it was not to be protected by the lock. So re they removed that processing out of the lock that, that actually improved things. And also they turned the lock into a read-write mutex so that the reads could be improved oh, okay. from one side. And I think that was one more big factor that helped it. Yeah. Any other questions? Last call. All right. Thank you. Thank you all.